good Friday morning. It is a feel-good football Friday. And last night, you had one of the cooler moments of the NFL season. I didn't think it could happen. I wasn't the only one. The majority didn't think it could happen that Baker Mayfield could come into this game and have success. And he pulled off a miracle with a 98-yard game-winning drive with just an unbelievable throw for a touchdown. Seeing Sean McVay on the sideline, he looked more happy last night than he did when he won the Super Bowl. So that was fun on Thursday night football, of course. The Jets and the Giants in their very tough matchups this weekend. We will get into more of that. And Steve Cohen, again, is tossing money around like the Mets fans wanted him to do, signing Brandon Nimmo to a deal that is more than what the Blue Jays gave to Springer. Think about that. If you would have told me that two years ago, I would have said, you're nuts. And then he also brought in David Robertson, which I thought was a very good move. So all that's on the table on this Feel Good Football Friday. Good morning, Boomer. How are you? Good morning, G. I'm doing great, especially after watching that game last night. I was really happy for Baker Mayfield. I mean, what he did last night was ridiculous. I mean, you know, you could see him looking at his card, wondering what was going on, and looking at his wrist, the card on his wrist, and wonder what was going on half the time. But uh, I, this is more of a failure of Derek Carr and the Raiders. Yeah, seriously. Now I know the defense, you know, gave up the final touchdown drive of 98 yards. You don't want you don't want that to happen. But the uh, interception that Derek Carr threw at the end of the first half into the end zone uh, was just a disaster. And from that point on, they couldn't get anything going offensively. They only scored three points in the second half. And uh, you know, this is a team that was surging and was coming back, and all of a sudden, uh, you know. The NFL is an amazing place. A guy like Baker Mayfield gets off the plane on Tuesday night. Yeah. Has one walkthrough practice, essentially, on Wednesday. And then somehow he and Sean McVay are able to call plays that match the, uh, I guess, the Rams offense. And Kirk Herbstreet last night said that because of what Kevin Stefanski does in Cleveland, where Baker was two stops ago, that there was some similarities to the offense that they could really focus on and give Baker a little bit easier of a job in terms of, like, this is where you're going with the ball. We're blocking up seven. Don't worry about blitzes and all that other stuff. And somehow they were able to score one more point than the Raiders to the tune of 17-16. to Yeah, there are two sides of this story, of course. The great Baker Mayfield side, and you feel good for him. He gets bounced around. Of course, Deshaun Watson, who was the stone, you know, worst guy in the league right now, gets there, and Baker Mayfield's got to leave. Then he goes down to Carolina. The coach gets fired. It's a mess for him. And then he comes in in this miraculous situation, and that's fun to see. It's just like, it's like movie-like. And the other side of it is this has to be the worst loss that a team has had in the NFL to this point because it essentially, in my opinion, ended their season. Now, there's a couple other teams that are are out of it, and you could say that they had a shot early on in the season, but we're sitting here on December 9th, and the Raiders were winning some games. They were getting hot. Things were changing. People were feeling differently about Derek Carr and feeling differently about Josh McDaniels, and maybe if they found a way to get really hot and win out, they could be in the conversation for a wild card. That's all over now. It's all over. This has been a miserable season for them. The fact that they could not find a way to, one, score more points, or two, come up with a single play on that 98-yard drive, and they did. There was an interception, but it got called back because of pass interference. It's just... I mean, just amazing. Just amazing. They couldn't make a play to not lose 17-16 to to Baker Mayfield, who got there two days ago, uh, and the Rams. And one last thing about Baker Mayfield. We have gone from, like, you know, 10 years ago, maybe in prior to that, you know, a league that was never made any trades, never made any trades, nothing, because guys couldn't get up to speed with the offense, <laughs> Um, you had guys who maybe didn't fit into the locker room, or there's just no way this guy could come in, even wide receivers, there's no way someone could come in and do this. To now, today, where a guy could get off a plane on a Tuesday and go win a game for you on a Thursday. And remember, crazy. that was a waiver wire pickup. Obviously, and, I know. And I was reading I was reading that um, you know, he got released. Now he had to know something. Right. But the moment he got released, he had a plane booked for LA. Without even knowing that he was getting picked up by L.A. Well, he's just a little step ahead type I, of thing. I, I, you know, I don't know if he was going to L.A. for a vacation or what he was doing. Well, he was probably, all right, <laughs> there has to be with the Matt Stafford story that's been going on for a while. 
and then John Wolford, we know who he is already, and then he ends up getting hurt. You know that Baker Mayfield is toiling in Carolina talking to his agent. Is there any place, if I can get my release, that would take me? So you know these conversations were probably happening behind the scenes. Of course. And then it's like, yeah, L.A. is the place. McVay would sign you. McVay would claim you. And it actually turned out to be that the Rams were the only team that put in a claim for him. Absolutely, right. Wow. So, I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm shocked. I was watching the game last night. And I'm just thinking, you know, the first half, he had a couple of nice passes. I'm like, all right, he seems like he's got it. Yeah. And then there were a couple of times where it looked like he was lost. And then all of a sudden on that 98-yard drive, a 98 yard drive, they get five completions in that drive, four or five completions that were all right on the money. Like, that was the kid that everybody saw coming out of college. Right. And I'm sure that he desperately wanted to show that again. And I, he's probably thinking to himself, like, I may never get that opportunity again. Now, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm sure that he's going to start as long as Matt Stafford is Matt Stafford's done. hurt right for the year. So the yeah. rest of the year. Now, uh, you know, obviously next year I would imagine that Matthew Stafford comes back and plays if he's healthy. Um, but this is the exact thing that that every that everybody who was rooting for Baker Mayfield needed to see for him to continue his career and have another shot at being a starting quarterback. Now I know I only I know that Sean McVay only had like two days to have his hands on him, but we have seen this year, you know, how much coaching can do to make a guy look better. You know, whether it's you know Daniel Jones, uh, whether it's this situation. Here, whether it's Tua Tunga Vailoa down in Miami, I understand he got Tyreek Hill as well, but Mike McDaniel, that was a huge help for him. So we've really seen there's been multiple examples. And wow. Geno Smith, who was sitting around in that Pete Carroll system and having an opportunity to watch and then gets his opportunity, how, how coaching can change a quarterback's career. Right. We've got multiple examples of that this year. And and now all of a sudden we have Brock Purdy out in San Francisco. That is right. So we'll see what happens there as well. How about the fact that the Raiders lost their fourth game this year mm-hmm. where they had at least a 13 point lead. Oh my God. Miserable. Being a Raiders fan this year has to be miserable. And you got two of the most embarrassing losses on your resume. The one that you couldn't lose because the Rams didn't have a quarterback and they signed Baker Mayfield two days ago. And Jeff Saturday's first game as a head coach. (laughs) So those two situations where everybody said there's no way the Raiders could lose those games because of the circumstances, they lost both of them. What does that say about Josh McDaniels? That the guy is... There's a lot to be desired there for him to be a head coach. There's kind of something missing there for sure. Yeah, I mean, an offensive coordinator, he's he's great. But, you know, he got off to a great start in Denver. Then everything fell apart. You know, that whole mess in Indianapolis where he quit on them and ended up coming back. I mean, this year has been awful. Now, I know the offense looked really good the last couple of weeks and people were starting to believe again. But, I mean, my Lord, (laughs) those are some really bad losses. And you just, as you mentioned, all the leads that they have choked up this year. Uh, and they're going to keep him because all the reports are that they can't pay him and another coach right now because of what's going on with Mark Davis and that organization. But wow, it just it just doesn't feel I'll right. You, if, if I were Derek Carr, I'd be crying at that post game press conference. For yeah, sure. I know, I know. As you already I mean, did they were, earlier, as they the were year. trying to fight back. Anyway, so Stevie Cohen, I told you, is going to go up north of three hundred and ten, maybe twenty million, maybe on his way to three forty. Sure. And he gets taxed at ninety eight uh, cents for every dollar that he goes over that threshold of two ninety three and he's spending the money. Uh he is uh, this is a Met fan's delight. Uh I think, you know, keeping Brandon Nimmo is is part of the foundation of the franchise moving forward. You know, he's not Aaron Judge, but he is a homegrown Met. Everybody likes him here. Sure. Everybody likes the way that he plays. Everybody thinks that, you know, he is a spark plug that the Mets couldn't have lost. And even if, you know, Sterling Marte wouldn't want the center field, now he doesn't have to. And I think it's a it's a signing that, you know, just basically you're at the right place at the right time if you're the player. Money is being bandied about. Uh, I think it was very important for the Mets to keep, you know, where they wanted to be able to keep their players. And to spend this kind of money, look, it's his money. I don't really care. Keep spending the money and keep adding to this team. And I love the fact that uh, they signed Robertson. I wanted Robertson last year. Yeah, I think everybody did at the trade deadline. It didn't happen. He ended up going to the Phillies. And if you're going to tell me that he's not going to be deterred by the competitive balance tax, luxury tax, then I'm I'm with you. This is great. Keep spending the money. But, you know, there is 
there is a scale that happens. Like, so the first year that you go over that level, you get taxed at the number that you said. Then it grows the second year, grows the third year, and then you stay at that level until you get under it. So the only thing that concerns me is that will he at some point be conscious of that where deals like this end up being a problem? Now, it doesn't seem like it at this point. doesn't seem like it at all. And I'm, I'm feeling good about him just going out there and spending, and we've heard so much about potential Shohei Otani trades and signings. Well, and, that's going to be the thing. So in two yeah. years, when Scherzer and Verlander are up, yeah, what happens at that point? Sure. But right now, in the short term, the immediate team – they're trying to win right now. Yeah, and and I just and I'm glad they haven't gotten any worse. That 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 for sure is a fact. The Mets have not gotten. I would worse like to think the- they actually gotten better with uh, with Verlander, assuming that he's going to make his you know 25 to 30 starts. You would think. I mean, because Jacob Degrom didn't give you much. Giannis is good. I, I think it's a really good signing too. Yeah, but I mean, you're also you're losing Bassett, you're losing Taiwan Walker, you're bringing in Quintana. I mean, if they end up signing. Uh, Kodai Senga, and I've never seen him pitch, but everybody's very high on him. Then maybe you could say that is an upgrade. But, I mean, it's it's debatable. Now, I think Robertson is better than Seth Lugo. Lugo's gone. Robertson's in. Uh, they made the trade for the lefty from the Rays, um, so which they needed a lefty in the bullpen. So I, I would say that, that marginally uh, they have gotten better, but I still feel like they're lacking something in the lineup. That's just now, if you're telling me, you know, Nimmo, Marte are going to stay healthy, you know, Lindor and Alonzo are going to stay healthy. Then McNeil, then McNeil obviously is, is a, is a given, you know, that I just feel like there's a, there's a lack of a power bat that is in there. And I want to see how they, how well, they handle that. That leaves one area. Yeah. That leaves either third base or DH or DH. Yeah. Or left field. Sure. Yep. That's- Assuming that McNeil is playing second base. Right, so do they end up counting on Francisco Alvarez and Brett Beatty uh, to try to squeeze something out of those guys, or do they go out uh, and make an upgrade at the DH position or one of those positions? So I'd just like to see that. If I saw one more bat come in, I'd be I'd be very thrilled. But it is, I mean, it's crazy and great for Brandon Nimmo. But I mean, the guys, you know, he's getting they they stretch it out to eight years, so it's twenty million dollars per year that he's getting. So. In in today's baseball, with we see these crazy numbers, the twenty million dollars isn't that much. But with the total of the contract, which I saw somebody tweet out, the total of the contract is more than what George Springer got. Like, yeah, I mean, you well, never would have thought that. So the point being, it's at the right place at the right time. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's all it is. That you have to, and you've had to have had to have performed, and your team had to like you if they wanted to retain you. Well. Yeah, of course. They I mean, know you. They know you better than anybody. Right, one hundred percent. And one of the things we said yesterday was, you know, the reason that you really want to keep Brandon Nimmo is there's not that type of guy out there that you can replace him with. Like, obviously, you didn't want to lose Jacob Degrom, but you lost Jacob Degrom, and you think, okay, I'm going to bring in Verlander to replace him. You know, you lose a Seth Lugo, it's like, okay, I'm going to bring in uh, Robertson to replace him. You're going to lose potentially Chris Bassett. You lost uh, Taiwan Walker. I'm going to bring in Quintana to replace him, maybe Kodai Sengen to replace him. With Brandon Nimmo in this particular market and what they have in their system, there wasn't a replacement. Right, so just so you know, the Nimmo contract hasn't hit the you know hasn't hit their uh, their numbers yet. But Max Scherzer forty three three, that's uh, Verlander forty three three, Francisco Lindor thirty two, Starley Marte nineteen five, Edwin Diaz seventeen two, Carlos Carrasco fourteen, uh, Jose Quintana thirteen, James McCann twelve. You got to get him out of here. Mark Canna ten. David Robertson ten, Escobar nine five, and then you you have to still throw in there uh, Brandon Nimmo's twenty. That's right, and that's not in there just yet. And then of course you have Pete Alonso, who's who's in arbitration. Now do you try to buy that arbitration out and then extend him as well? Yeah, I don't know if they'll do it this year. Uh, they may wait. You know, and you got Jeff McNeil too, who won a batting title, who's going to go into arbitration as well. So both of those guys are at arbitration two levels. Yeah. And I, you know, you like both of those guys. So if you like Brandon Nimmo, you got to like those two guys. Oh, of course. Now is the time to try to extend them if you can. I doubt they will just simply because of the money. But I, I all I know is that he is all, well on his way to spending that 320 to 340. I told you he was going to spend 
the morning we came in here when I said Verlander is coming. Yeah. When DeGrom, because right. that Friday DeGrom signed the deal in Texas. Uh-huh. And uh, we came in on that Monday morning. And I said, Verlander's coming. DeGrom never returned the phone call. Mm-hmm. So that told me that they went to Texas to go get that five-year deal and that they couldn't shop it back to the to the Mets because Texas wasn't going to be used as leverage. And so, so Jake signs that deal. And uh, it was that weekend, last weekend, where that all came down with Verlander. And uh, Steve Cohen, I told you, said, you know, how far can he go into the luxury tax without really ticking off his other owners? Well, but the I thing- said up to 340. He said up, to, uh, his guys told him up to 340 million. Right. Now, but the, the other part of that, though, is when you do end up spending all that money and then you get taxed, that money gets spread out to the other teams. So, like, how much can you really piss off the other teams by spending money when they also get a chunk of that tax? I mean, that's the whole revenue sharing. That's the whole thing. The competitive balance tax is where it all comes from. For me, I you know, I would look at, you know, the Dodgers. I would look at San Diego. And, you know, now the Yankees and the Mets, those are the four teams that are the teams that are – and Philadelphia, I would say, five teams that are up there at the upper echelon of spending. Right. That, you know, it's not just Steve Cohen. It's these other teams as well. But these other teams feel like they've got more talent on them for less money. And that's the I, one I, thing that I would say. I'm just telling you that he's not done spending. Mm. I, I, it's hard to, like, with right now, right now, they have a, let's take a look. Their payroll total right now as we sit, and this is without Brandon Nimmo. Mm-hmm. According to Spot Track. Their total payroll, the total projected payroll is going to be two hundred eighty-eight million. That would include uh, Nimmo, and they're not yeah, done yet. Right. I mean, and you've got teams like the the Phillies right now that are one hundred and sixty-eight, and you feel like their roster is more stacked than what the Mets yeah, are. but they also they you know so uh, you know, Bryce Harper is going to be out for a while. Yep. Uh, they have arbitration numbers that they have to hit as well. Uh, the question really now, I think, is can the Mets move James McCann? Yeah, let's hope so, because that would free up some money and definitely help that situation. All right, it is Boomer and Geo on the fan and CBS Sports Network, a feel-good football Friday with some baseball as well. We've got Jerry Recco back. He got kicked in the nuts last night by Ohio State, but he's here, and he's ready to deliver the sports coming up next. 